Hello and welcome to Studio Sundays. I'm your host, Gianna Andrews. It's Sunday. The birds are chirping. I hope you're cozy with a cup of tea or coffee. Maybe you're heading out on an adventure right now. Whatever you're doing, if you love nature, if you love the outdoors, this interview is for you. This week on the podcast, I'm super excited to welcome Damien Echebard, head of Patagonia Workwear. We chat about Damien's path that led him to working for one of the most progressive outdoor brands in the world. I was excited to hear from an insider in the industry what Patagonia Workwear is doing to save our home planet. Hint, it has to do with our connection to the farmers that grow our food. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. And with that, let's dive into it. Well, your audio sounds great, so that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, look at my sweet gamer headphones. And... <laughs> yes. It looks profesh, and you got the background of beautiful California, I'm assuming. Yeah, this is uh, one of the Patagonia campuses in Southern California. My name is Gianna Andrews. I'm an artist and I've been sharing my story and art uh, with the world for the past like seven years. It all kind of started for me when a mountain biking accident, um, I broke my back when I was living in Montana at the time and I was confined to a clamshell back brace. So I kind of turned to art, which was really just a hobby at the time. And that spurred just this whole new passion for me of like really diving into creativity. And that's how I started my career. That was the foundation. And I've been full-time for the past seven years, just kind of by sharing my story is how I've connected with people and made everything work. And then recently um, through Studio Sundays, what I'm doing is not only telling my story, but also sharing stories of others. And that's kind of where the podcast was born out of. And it's just been super fun to connect with people all over, um, artists and business professionals alike. So uh, Damien, welcome to Studio Sundays. Awesome. Thank you so much. What an inspiring story to turn such a hardship into, you know, a positive reality. Love that. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. It was That's tough. <laughs> yeah, it was tough, but also, um, gosh, I feel like the universe really hammers things in when we need to make a change. And that was my situation. Yeah, you weren't noticing the small little subtle signs. So it was like, all right, here you go. <laughs> exactly. Um, exactly. So first question, how do you pronounce your last name? Just so I'm getting that correctly. All right. It is Echabard. Echabard. Okay. So Damien yeah. Echabard. Gotcha. Nailed Thank it. you. <laughs> is that what, what heritage is that? It is French Basque. So my, uh, my mom and dad and entire family is from France. Um, okay. I guess I'm first generation American. Wow. <laughs> so were you born in the States? I was, I was born in Southern New Jersey. My, uh, my family immigrated over with a big group of French families to open up a glass blowing factory because um, the soil in southern New Jersey was was very sandy or is very sandy. So yeah, they came over to open that up and I grew up in a little French community in southern New Jersey. Amazing. And yeah, I see that you speak three languages. So you speak French, <laughs> English, which for an American is very um, rare, I would say. <laughs> so is it French, English and Spanish? In that order. Yeah. My friends like to make fun of it as ESL. You know, it's like a little, yes. sounds like you have something wrong with you. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. So you grew up in New Jersey. What brought you now you're on the West coast. Um, what brought you out West and like, what was your childhood? Like, were you always living in New Jersey or how did you find your way out of there? Yeah, I definitely did my Super young formative years in New Jersey um, and Pennsylvania, kind of both went to kind of went up to university in Pennsylvania. And then, um, yeah, I got my dream job working at Burton Snowboards in Vermont. So that kind of kickstarted it all ever since I was in, I don't know, junior high, kind of skateboarding and, and looking in, up to snowboarders. I was kind of very mediocre at skateboarding <laughs> and uh, snowboarding just kind of clicked with me. And back then there was snow in, in New Jersey and Southern Pennsylvania. Um, and yeah, always had a dream to, to work with my idols up in, in Vermont and in, in Burlington, but then yeah, kind of in the industry, meeting people got offered a position in Vancouver, British Columbia, and my head just clicked right away. I was like, Whistler, I'm there. And they're like, no, you know, it's not Whistler, it's it's Vancouver. But for me, that hour and a half drive was 
you know, one and the same as living in Whistler. So uh, made the move to beautiful British Columbia and spent 10 years um, working for Heli Hansen in, in BC. Okay. And so first to go back a little bit, um, you must have learned to snowboard as a kid. When did that kind of, what was your like first memory of snow or being, yeah, snowboarding? Did your parents take you or did you find it through friends? Yeah, we couldn't really skateboard in the winter. So um, I think I was coming home from an indoor soccer practice and I was in in jeans and like a, a soccer team puff coat. And there was a little ski hill with a rope toe, maybe like 15 minutes away from my house. And after soccer practice, my mom just dropped me off there. Um, for the first two times I went back to back, I never made it up the rope toe. I just kept burning holes in my gloves and really hurting my hand. And on That's the third fair. time, I finally made it up up the mountain and then kind of from there figured my way down this tiny little bump of a ski hill um i think it was called bell mountain in new jersey um on the other side near like new hope um area and uh yeah that's how i learned in, in jeans and a puff jacket and fell in love with it immediately and started going to the poconos in pennsylvania a little bit more and then weekend trips to vermont and then different little like snowboard teams and clubs through various skate shops in the area and uh from there the rest is history still snowboarding as much as i can today even though now i'm in sunny socal <laughs> yeah for real that's a bit of a haul for you yeah i would say the local ski hill now is six hours away and it would be mammoth yeah mammoth tahoe okay. is probably an eight hour drive and then we do yeah. have some la la resorts we've been fortunate i've only lived in california for two years and it's been a pretty wet two winters in California. So I have had a few pow days just outside of Los Angeles, which is an odd thing to say, but they happen. And how are you liking that transition to like the warmer climate? And are you getting into surfing and all of that? It's pretty epic outside of the winter months because the winter months, I see all my friends in, in, uh, in Vancouver and Whistler and Vancouver Island having a blast. So I definitely miss that. But, you know, it makes me happy to see them happy. So I still feel that energy energy through them. And yes, my first time living in a real surf town. So I would say I would surf. I mean, the we have a really nice wave literally on the way to work from where I live to the Patagonia office. There's like three different waves to choose from. So usually we have little board meetings in the ocean um, before work, nice. probably three to four times a week, <laughs> midweek. That's amazing. Well, as a cold water surfer, and it's very cold up here in the winter, I can say I'm jealous of you down there in Southern California. <laughs> Where are you located? Warm. I'm in Port Angeles on the Olympic Peninsula. Oh, so, I love Port Angeles. Yeah, you know where it is then. We look right across at Canada. Yeah, you do. Um, I've done, I also really enjoy sailing. My time at Heli Hansen, which is a very solid ski and sailing brand, I really mm -hmm. got into a lot of sailing and I've used Port Angeles as kind of a halfway point from Seattle to to Vancouver as a little stopover. Okay, yeah, I wanted to ask you more about sailing because that's something that's always interested me. And and did did that start for you as a kid too in New Jersey, or when did you find sailing? You know, I kind of ignored it. It's been in the family for a long time. Uh, where my dad's family is from in Brittany, France, it's a really well recognized area for offshore sailing and there's a lot of sailing schools there but I kind of didn't take it up until I moved to Vermont actually and learned on Lake Champlain at a little community sailing center I was like this looks like a cool thing there's like a skate park right there and then the community sailing center so it was kind of hand in hand and get some time on the water and you don't have to own any material it's like an easy access way to learn how the wind works and how you can propel yourself using yeah, that natural resource. So it's pretty, pretty fun. And then, yeah, moving to to BC there uh, with Heli Hansen, I just got really immersed in the sailing culture and how to talk about it and who like our ambassadors are in the sport of sailing. And um, I just always watch these cool film clips about these boats just bashing through big ocean waves and getting covered with with salt water. And I was like, I kind of want to do that one day. So kind of worked my way up to that. And um, I've been fortunate to do a few few sailing epics so far in life that's amazing what is like the craziest sailing adventure you've ever done <laughs> uh and also the hardest thing i think i've ever done in life was crossing the southern ocean from cape town south africa to the west coast of australia and Fremantle. it took us 26 days um unfortunately for us a jet stream with 
further up. So usually that's like a downwind sleigh ride, they call it. You're just surfing huge swell all the way to Australia. But with the jet stream a little bit high, uh, we were going upwind and bashing through those waves instead of surfing down them. So it was a, a very hard 26 days at sea. But I learned a lot about myself and how to really be with other people for extended periods of time with nowhere to hide and nowhere to go. Yeah. And you just kind of put your differences aside and jump right in and like, all right, we got to get there together. <laughs> wow. That sounds brutal. Just so no land for 26 days. You're basically just. Yeah. At one point we were closer to the international space station. That was our closest human um, was Whoa, in space. Oh, that's crazy. That I've never cool... even thought about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of weird because there's no shipping lanes down there. There's no plane routes. So yeah, you really do feel pretty isolated. So how do you balance your adventures and sailing like that trip with your professional life? Because you also had a long career with Helly Hansen and now you're working with Patagonia. How are you getting personal time for your adventures? And were you taking time off during those during that trip specifically? Or how does that work? Yeah, I would say I've been pretty fortunate, you know, work hard and play hard and kind of senior management gets to see that in your work ethic. So, you know, you get your get your work done, do it well at a high standard and <clears throat> excuse me. And yeah, you just ask for the time off and I've been very fortunate to have it. Yeah, have it taken off. So it has been paid time off, which is really nice, kind of conglomerating all your vacation time together for for one epic. But uh yeah, also the industry we choose to work in. Um, it's pretty notorious for, you know, comfortable pay, I would say, but uh, definitely have that work-life balance is, makes it worth it. So Helly Hansen being a core sport of sailing, they were super keen to to let me take that off. In fact, I think Helly now sponsors that race. So that was kind of a neat mm -hmm. 360. And um, so far at Patagonia, just all the folks here are pretty big adventurers and you know, mountain athletes and ocean athletes. So everyone kind of finds their time off to to get out and practice what really brings them joy in life. And when you have that kind of joy in life and you find find something out of these adventures, whether it's personal growth, um, communicating with a larger group and how to move in, in dicey terrain or whatever it may be, you kind of come back to work with a renewed sense of of energy. So you come back and for me, at least I come back and I'm really keen to to get to work and make things happen. Uh, that makes sense. And I would imagine those companies too, since they are so outdoor oriented, are kind of supporting you in those goals. And that's maybe why it's more of a symbio symbiotic relationship than if you were working for like a tech company or something. Yeah, they just might not get it in that no. in that industry. They'd be like, uh, what do you mean? At what your time at Helly Hansen, what were you focused on mainly there? I was a marketing manager for Canada. So at the time, Canada was one of the larger countries for Heli. Um, it is a Norwegian-based company. And there was something, a lot of synergy between the kind of Nordic way of living and the Canadian way of living. And just by making great product for those kind of climates, I think the Canadians just really latched onto it. And also being a European brand, the eastern coast of Canada, which is a little more trend forward, really jived well with with Heli Hansen and the products they made. So it was a big focus on becoming a core ski brand, a core sailing brand, and also for your day-to-day -day kind of urban lifestyle. So pretty big on rainwear. And then there was another category there that I worked on, which is workwear, which is what I do now at Patagonia. I head up the workwear team from a product um, marketing and kind of long-term strategy role. So yeah, Heli and my time at Burton really kind of brought me up to here and now I'm in, I'm attached to the sport industry, but working on a completely different category, uh, which I find really exciting actually. So yeah, I still get to hear about, you know, all the cool mountain bike events or the cool uh, snowboarding and skiing and, and all the cool sports. But um, I kind of keep that for my personal time and get to focus 100% of kind of business or, or work on, on workwear. What Patagonia is doing with workwear is interesting. I think I... Um, I got a pair of the workwear overalls like years ago for painting. And um, it's cool how they're adding in that element. Cause I feel like when you think about the workwear categories, it's very like Carhartt or like, kind of like not really necessarily representing people that are maybe affiliated with wanting to be outside in nature, but also kind of like hands in the dirt working. So what are kind of the goals and strategy behind um, the development of the Patagonia workwear brand? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our our founder, Yvonne, once there's a, a quote that we like to reiterate around the office. He said, you know, the next revolution is going to be in food. Um, and this is not quote for quote, but it's how I remember it. And he said, you know, people eat at least three times a day, but they might just buy a ski jacket, um, you know, once in 10 years, one time in 10 years kind of thing. So the next revolution is going to be in food. Uh, we have a whole Patagonia provisions side of the business, which is all food um, grown regeneratively and organically to try to get farmers converted into that, in that space. And then workwear, when we think about our mission at saving our home planet, it's truly the people that are working with their hands that have the greatest impact. The, the top polluting industries in the world are you know, energy, food, um, construction. So by directly working with people in those fields, we have the best chance of actively getting to our mission statement of saving our home planet. So, you know, healthy soil leads to better air quality, leads to better food for humans, happier, healthier people, um, building with alternative materials, whether it's reclaimed wood or hempcrete or straw bale construction um, can be done at scale and also has less impact on our planet. Um, and of course, in energy, looking at alternative ways of propelling ourselves, whether that's solar, wind, um, those are all the communities that we're trying to attract via Patagonia um, workwear. And we try to do it through uplifting the story of those folks working hard day in and day out. So trying to normalize different ways of working, I think, is kind of the main goal. Um, and yeah, attracting a, huge, a way broader base there other than just kind of sport folks if we go after the whole workwear folks too then um you know there'll be a larger base that we can work with in different kind of voting campaigns or saving the environment campaigns um it just broadens the whole patagonia base so i see that really as my goal is bringing a whole new demographic and skew of people to into the patagonia fold and that's done through different types of work interesting i i really like that concept and that and that just makes so much sense how also, the more connected we are with our food and where it's actually coming from, the better chance we have at saving the planet. I was an environmental studies major in college and have kind of tried to integrate that into my art as well. Like, how can we tell the story and actually connect with nature? And so it seems like, yeah, by are you like actively working with farmers and and kind of working on projects like that? Yeah, absolutely. We, we want to make it normal and we also help farmers both from like the textile industry and also the food industry so who grows and what how they grow different types of crops for for clothing whether it be hemp or cotton um, and how that's grown for making clothes better and more planet friendly also especially um, more so in the whole food systems industry so going from organic to regenerative organic or traditional and being in conversion to organic all that are super important steps and we use kind of the Patagonia platform, which has a pretty big audience to kind of uplift those stories and try to make it more normal to hear about that kind of terminology. Um, what what do you think, like as far as your personal values, obviously you are an outdoors person, you love nature, but what specific personal values do you integrate into your work? Um, I really believe you have to speak to it from an authentic space. Um, my family on my mom's side in France are sixth generation farmers. So I really spent my summers and a bunch of time internships, we call them, uh, going to work on the family farm in France. And I think those were like the happiest moments <clears throat> in, in my youth kind of growing up is being outside, working with my hands, coming home with dirt under the fingernails and just kind of feeling a lot of self-worth. So I try to bring that to to workwear and kind of engage in these conversation with with folk fighting the hard fight um, and kind of bring that to life, I think. So authenticity is really important. And if you don't know something, don't pretend to know it and just kind of go with the flow and, and learn. People love talking about their trades and their skills and bringing you on board. You don't always have to be an expert in everything, but if you approach it with an authentic interest, then I think it, you're set up for success. So I think that's, I guess, what I bring to it. Um, even from a, a sports side, just always having that, you know, I'm learning mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't ever do too many avalanche courses or, you know, clinics and different skills. So it's always fun to to learn and keep an open mind. And I think that that takes you really far and brings you into that authenticity of caring about what you're doing at that point in time. Mm -hmm. 
it's like staying humble and continuing to be a student. Like there's not really ever a point we hit where we know everything about everything. So there's always something new to learn and nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. Humble is, is very, very good one. Yeah. Staying humble and also having a lot of empathy and kind of understanding people's hardships and kind of going along in their journey and the ups and the downs and you know, we, we like to say when we do storytelling at work that we don't just kind of parachute in, tell a story and leave. We try to build those relationships over time um, and really work with the folks that we talk about in, in our, in our storytelling. Yeah. And that's, I think what Patagonia does a good job at and clearly what you're helping them foster is just the more you can tell a story and is, is how you connect with people and your audience. So, and, and how you can also educate people. So that's really interesting. What advice would you give to your past self? Maybe like Burton snowboards, Damien, (laughs) you know, I would say if you think of something and you really want to do it, go for it. Don't let it hold you back. The what ifs, you know, the work will always be there when you return, um, go out and explore as much as possible and bring that back to you into your daily life. Um, share it with others. I think, I could have worked a little bit better at sharing experiences uh, with folks around me, whether it's family and friends. Um, I really thrive on on getting outside and and doing stuff. But where I could be better at is kind of sharing my my stories a little bit more and um, and yeah, just having conversations about it. I'm not not the best at that, which is really nice of you to have reached out to me and why I really value this uh, this call with you because I'm not the best at this part of my life. So trying to do more of this instead of just like always saying, oh, people aren't interested in that, like whatever, you know, maybe yeah. one or two people are interested and it's nice to connect with them on a, on a different level and kind of sharing story. Yeah. Well, I'm always just interested in like the humans behind the work that's being put out there. And I think maybe that is like just the value in you and your story. It's like you've kind of evolved in the person you are to be where you're at and what got you to where you are. And like, I love those types of stories. Um, So thank you for sharing. Yeah. This is way outside my comfort zone. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Are there any hardships you've been through that you feel like have made you more of who you are today? Yeah. That's a, uh, a, a powerful question. I have lost a little sister. So sometimes I feel like I have to live for, for two. Um, Sometimes that can lead to being a little more reckless, but also, allows me to take more chances, maybe more risks and kind of go on different adventures and maybe be in places that I normally wouldn't have. It kind of pushes me to live a little bit outside my, my comfort zone in terms of like, yeah, you know, feeling very fortunate to be alive and take this breath every day and and kind of go through a daily routine, having a job that I'm really thankful for and continuing making new friends and new acquaintances. So I think that's definitely shaped me. That happened at a pretty young age. And it's wow. also led me to live at times, probably that, as you said, that the, that Burton um, self of <laughs> that was a little reckless. Um, but yeah, in maturing now, I'm a little more cautious, of course. But um, yeah, I think that really shaped my life to kind of live it as full as I can. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I'm sorry for your loss. But at the same time, I'm glad that it's allowed you to, I mean, there's nothing that can make that better, but I'm glad that it's allowed you to think about fully experiencing your life because it is those things that are so hard. We have to go through that allow us to see everything in a new perspective. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. It makes me thankful a little bit more for even small little experiences and um, just trying to, to care a little bit more. I know that can sound pretty, pretty selfish to try to live for two and then go out and do experiences, but hopefully I can bring that back and through my work, help uplift others and other stories and yeah, do my little part. Yeah. But living life to its fullest. I mean, that's what it's about. I think I was almost paralyzed when I broke my back. And like, if that had happened, I don't like, I guess just even that perspective of like, wow, I almost like would be in a wheelchair right now. That would be um, a whole different ball game and Mm -hmm. it just gives a new perspective on like even going for a walk around the neighborhood with my dog you know so I think that's my biggest fear in life is breaking my back (laughs) yeah I wouldn't recommend it if you can avoid it um but it seems like you're on a good path and you're like through your most reckless years so 
Uh, we'll see. Yeah. There's different types of recklessness. For sure. <laughs> What excites you now about the future, where you're headed, and maybe professionally or personally, or both? Yeah, I think um, a lot of things bring me down about the future when you look at the scale of everything happening around the world around us with wars and and um, the climate crisis and just kind of humanity in general. But then what brings me back and makes me kind of happy and thankful is that I'm going to use my time here on this planet to try to make as many little or big changes as possible and try to live with a positive outlook on it, even though it can feel really grim. And when you look at the scale of the planet and how it takes all of us to make a change to extend life on earth, it can get pretty heavy at times, especially when we're working at Patagonia where day in, day out, it's the topic of conversation. Like yeah. how is everything that we're doing laddering up to helping save our home planet? It can weigh a lot, but then when you kind of bring it down to a digestible size, you're like, all right, well, I'm here and these are the things I can do and who I can help influence and work with and get out and, and vote and kind of do your part in a functioning society kind of brings me hope because I feel like, a lot of humanity is in it for the good. You know, it's always a 1% that can really ruin it for the rest. But if if we just keep going little by little and staying positive, we'll, we'll get there. So I think that really kind of keeps me going day in and day out. Well, I like hearing like, I feel like we always say save the planet, but like our home planet is a phrase that I haven't heard used a lot. Um, but I, I really like that. And it's an interesting position you're in with gra like, working for one of the most progressive brands, I don't know, maybe in the world that cares about climate change and like is actually trying to make a difference, but then also grappling with that issue. It means you're facing the reality every day that a lot of people are either in denial about or not wanting to face um, or companies. And so I imagine there's almost, a, it's almost like a, a lot of weight is on your shoulders in a way. Um, because you, you like with Patagonia and maybe even personally, like you are that brand. So like, what can you do? And um, yeah, it's, it's a lot. And, and I always like asking people, I interview that question because it is such a hard time right now, but the more I just connect with like individuals, I just feel like most people are, most everyone I've talked to is like, wants the best for everybody and, and our planet. So mm -hmm. All we can do is keep spreading joy. It's like, that's kind of my goal. Yeah. And to be totally frank too, I love, um, I feel like I'm the one person in my original crew of friends that went kind of like the business trajectory, which is why I kind of went into marketing because I love how marketing can bring the business side and the art side together. Um, and I love that because a lot of my, my best friends are artists and I love art so much. It kind of brings me to a space where I can like breathe and think of someone creating a piece and then how that piece kind of lives on and continues to tell a story for as long as that piece is in existence. And, you know, a simple thing like that can really keep positivity high. And whether it's climate injustices or social injustices, it really kind of can bring it all together and, and wrap it all up in, in some kind of story. So thank mm -hmm. you for what you do. Oh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing everything today. Final question is, how do you spend your Sundays? This past Sunday was pure relax. I needed some time off for the body and, and healing. But most Sundays are doing something outdoors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Breathing, um, getting the heart rate up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Running, I, yeah, hiking. <laughs> yeah, I don't... Um, I don't relax well. I feel like I'm doing something wrong when I relax. So this past Sunday was, a, you know, focusing on breathing in deep and saying it's okay to just have a down day. Yeah, I must say, you know, weekend warrior, got to get out and do stuff. Yeah, it's like when those are the two days that you have completely free, that kind of need to get out. I totally get that. And also, we all need to relax and our bodies all need rest too. So it just depends on like what season you're in on how much time. That I have to flip it back to you though. Cause it's such an interesting question. What do you do on Sundays? I mean, I think as an outdoor person too, um, lately I've been, I'm training for a marathon and an ultra this, this summer. So I'm pretty much running on the weekends. Um, 
or recovering from running. <laughs> and then I have, um, I recently adopted a puppy. So like this last Sunday I went for a run with a group of friends and then just played with the dogs and worked on the garden. And it is kind of like, in a way it's my off day. Um, it's kind of the one day a week where I'm not putting pressure on myself to do anything involved with like running a business or creating art. So, mm -hmm. um, I do kind of take it as my day to just like a little bit of a personal day. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's a good use of a Sunday personal day. <laughs> for sure. For sure. All right, Damien. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything today. Um, chatting with me. I, um, I'm living vicariously through you, through, um, your weather that you have right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, but I hope you get to get out on the slopes again this winter. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really yeah. appreciate the time and, and what a wonderful conversation.